Good morning. The Committee on Health and Human Services will, will come to order. Uh, we do have quorum present, and it's Tuesday, January 24th, 2023, and we have three bills on our agenda today. Uh, first, we will be taking up um, Senate File 2, uh, the Paid Family uh, and Medical Leave Bill, and Senator Mann is here to present her bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, um, Senate File 2 establishes the Minnesota Paid Family and Medical Leave Program. It would provide Minnesotans a 12-week leave at partial wage replacement to take care of a new baby, bond with a new child, or take care of themselves or a family member who has suffered a major medical event. Out of almost 200 countries, the United States is one of seven that does not offer a paid leave program, and largely the remaining seven are micro-islands. The U.S. is certainly the only industrialized country without such a policy in place. We know that when it comes to staying home with a child, the benefits are innumerable. We have seen decreased maternal morbidity and mortality uh, at a time when America's rates of maternal morbidity and mortality are at an unacceptable high and only getting higher. We see increased rates and duration of breastfeeding, which we know leads to healthier babies and healthier moms. We have seen increased parental mental well-being, with depression being one of the most costly medical diagnoses of, at this time. We have seen better health outcomes for children, decreased, decreased rates of ear infections, GI infections, pneumonia, hospitalizations, and clinic visits. And we have seen increased financial stability after a life-changing event, which leads to more people returning to the workforce instead of leaving it altogether. And that also leads to a decrease on reliance of government services. We know that paid family and medical leave is a gender justice issue. When everyone is offered said leave, the uh, disparities against women in the workplace decrease. We know it is a workforce shortage issue. Again, when people have access to paid leave, they return to work instead of leaving the workforce altogether. It will affect our child care industry. It will affect our long-term care industry, both of which are in crises right now. And it is a racial justice issue. Too often, our BIPOC communities are left out of such benefits. And our bill is written in such a way that no one gets left behind. We know that economic inequality and generational transmission of low socioeconomic status in the United States are perpetuated through disparities in early childhood circumstances. Paid family and medical leave can help curb that growth in inequality and boost long-term economic growth for the entire state. And so obviously, paid family and medical leave is an economic issue. And with that, Madam Chair, I would like to introduce Ms. Deborah Fitzpatrick, who will give a brief overview of what is pertinent to our committee today. Uh, thank you, Senator Mann. I also just wanted to state that um, this bill has been to two other committees, and um, it has been heard in Jobs and Economic Development and the Labor Committee. The jurisdiction for the Health and Human Services Committee is Article 2 only, and that will be our focus today. Uh, please proceed, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Chair Wicklin, members of the committee. My name is Deborah Fitzpatrick. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at Children's Defense Fund Minnesota. In my prior role at the University of Minnesota, under contract with DEED, I led the nationally recognized research team that conducted Minnesota's legislatively mandated paid family and medical leave design and implementation study. I'm going to spend just a few minutes summarizing the sections under committee jurisdiction in Article 2, which govern the intersection of this new paid family and medical leave program and the DWP and MFIP programs. The Diversionary Work Program and the Minnesota Family Investment Program, in those programs, caregivers, those are persons who live with and provide care and support to minor children, are required to spend a specified number of hours every week engaged in work or work activities. Examples um, include job search activities, unsubsidized employment, and on-the-job training. Sections 1, 2, and 3, starting on line 65.20, remove this requirement while a participant is receiving paid family and medical leave benefits. A DWP or MFIP recipient would be unable to participate in work activities due to the underlying condition that qualified them for paid family and medical leave benefits. Moving on to section four, uh, the MFIP uh, uh, grant uh, benefit is composed of a cash portion and a food portion. Benefits change depending on income. 
Income is defined as earned and unearned under this program. Earned income is income that results from work, effort, or labor, and unearned income is a payment a family member did not expend individual effort or labor to receive. So starting on line 67.23, uh, uh, that defines the paid family and medical leave wage replacement um, under Senate File 2 as earned income, meaning it counts the same as it would if the person received the income from wages. Paid family and medical leave wage replacement is earned under this program based on past effort, work, or labor. I'll stop there, and if there are questions, I can answer them later. Uh, thank you. Um, now we will move to the uh, testif testimony that we have for this bill, which we have, uh, co let's see, in person, do we want to do that first? Okay. Um, in person, we have Corey Anderson. Welcome to the committee, and please, um, you can sign in after you testify, but um, please state your name for the record and go ahead. Madam Chair and members, my name is Corey Anderson, and I'm here representing NAFA, National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, along with MAHU, Minnesota Association of Health Underwriters, two organizations with many members in each legislative district and more than 1,000 members statewide. I'm the owner and founder of Disability Geek, insurance agency specializing in disability insurance and I've been in the business over 20 years and have four employees. Through the years, we've worked with over 1,200 clients protecting the income of business owners and their employees, both hourly and salaried. I, along with members of MAHU and NAFA, are opposed to Senate File 2. As a specialist in this area, I can tell you the private sector has affordable, short-term disability products available with very broad coverage for just about every group and individual. With many providers offering coverage for disability income, the market is competitive, so the prices are very affordable. To the extent that the advocates of the bill have run into problems finding coverage, they may need to talk to another agent that has more expertise in these lines of business. The perception of scarcity is not an accurate representation of our marketplace. What this bill does is put the state government in direct competition with private sector insurance carriers and insurance agents. In fact, this bill is a virtual market takeover by a state agency who has no experience delivering this service or accurately pricing such a product. Most employers already offer either subsidized short-term disability coverage to their employer or to their employees or voluntarily unsubsidized disability coverage to their employees, where the employee has the option to purchase group coverage. To the extent that the employee has not opted for coverage, they are making a value decision on what works best for their personal needs. We recommend the following if you move this bill forward. Leave the private sector to serve the market for short-term disability or medical leave, as it is called in the bill, and provide incentives for employers to provide that coverage to their employees. Mandate those employers with over 50 employees offer short-term disability coverage with tax incentives to do so, and outline more flexible minimum coverage requirements. Let the state concentrate on family leave coverage since there is not a well-developed private market that will be displaced. Our clients and the public are not interested in another unfunded mandate that creates a billion dollar payroll tax on businesses and their employees. The public likes the idea of coverage. They don't like the idea of another tax shrinking their paycheck in a time of high inflation with the economy moving toward a likely recession. Please vote no. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Um, and now we have, and is there a sign-in sheet out at the table? Yep. Yes. If you could please sign in um, for the record, that, that would be great. Thank you. And now we have one testifier who is on Zoom, and that is Tony Mangsko. Good morning. You did really good with pronouncing my last name. Very good. I had, I had so. help, so <laughs> thank you. Please proceed and, and yeah. state your name for the record. 
So thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the opportunity to testify in support of Minnesota House File 2 and Senate File 2, addressing the need for paid family and medical leave in our state. My name is Tony K. Manskow. I live in Rochester. I'm a volunteer for AARP, Isaiah, and the National Patient Advocate Foundation. Through the years, I've been caregiver for five family members. I shared caregiving responsibilities with my siblings when my dad was diagnosed with end-stage heart and lung disease and when my mom was diagnosed with cancer. When my parents' health started to decline, I became the guardian for my developmentally disabled brother. He has ongoing significant health issues. I officially became a member of the sandwich generation, caring for my kids with disabling health issues, aging parents, and brother. I have done all of this while working full time. My role as a family caregiver has been a financial strain. During a nine month period in 2017, I went without one third of my yearly income due to unpaid time off from work. I have had to file for bankruptcy in the past. In addition to the financial strain, there's also been an emotional strain. When my mom was in hospice, my family and I were so burnt out with trying to juggle work and figuring out who could afford to miss work. With all of this juggling of our work schedules, my mom died alone without family at her bedside. My belief is if we would have had a paid family and medical leave law in place, my family would have been at her side in her last moments of life. Unfortunately, my family's story is not uncommon. I work with cancer patients and their families and hear of the same type of experience. Senate File 2 will help ensure that every working Minnesotan can, can access paid leave protection when needed. This includes our neighbors striving to enter the workforce through the Minnesota Family Investment Program. I, like so many others, would do anything for loved ones. The value of a family's emotional support and presence during a loved one's illness cannot be measured and it should not be degraded or punished by the fear of financial difficulty. It's time for Minnesota lawmakers to pass a paid family and medical leave program that is comprehensive, accessible, and not dependent on whether your employer can offer it. So many family caregivers are counting on you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, and now, um, that is the end of the testifiers that we have. And so we will move to member questions. Do members have questions for the author or um, her testifier? Senator Atke. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, the first question uh, probably would be for yourself. This is a, a, a narrow little section of this bill, but this bill affects a lot uh, to do with health care. Are we going to see it again, or is this its only stop in this committee? Okay, and thank you, Madam Chair. And the, the, the part that I was going after there is this will have a huge impact on our hospitals, our long-term care. Basically, every, everybody included in the health, all the health care workers, that's why I thought, you know, we should have a little more of a discussion in this committee because it's going to be a big deal to them. Excuse me. Um, it, within the Labor Committee, I don't know if Senator Mann, if you would have any comments about what was discussed, if that <clears throat> covered some of the concerns that, you know, the healthcare workforce. Um. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so in labor and in jobs, um, we discussed pretty much the entire bill. <laughs> um, and not only that, but this bill has another four stops. So it is getting very thoroughly vetted, Senator Aki. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I got a couple more here yet. But for our author, you've got four more stops. What would those be? And would, um, you know, it's like here we've got a pretty narrow focus. Usually the further a bill goes on, the more narrow those focuses are. And I'm concerned about these type of uh, employers and providers having a chance to, you know, talk about how it will impact them. Um, you know, back in the jobs committee, it's, it's the whole state. 
this committee were focused on health care. Um, I'm just concerned about those providers, and will they have a chance going forward? Uh, Senator Mann. Madam Chair, Senator Ecke, yes, yeah, so they had, we, we had many, many, many testifiers and people talking about this in the previous committees. Um, we are going to go to judiciary, commerce, taxes, finance. Um, we're, we're hitting pretty much every, again, every committee. <laughs> And Senator Atke, also the, you know, health care providers could have submitted testimony to our committee. We did not receive any, or whatever we see, received is in your packet. Right, but they probably saw, like we did, our jurisdiction for today is pretty narrow. So they would have been outside of that. So that's why I bring it up. I don't know that they've been, at least what I'm hearing from them is they haven't had a voice at the table yet or didn't take that opportunity and I just have concerns there but I will go on to my next question for our author can an unemployed person file for paid family medical leave you know we're talking here about you know MFIP recipients and all this and I, I heard something about some non-working uh, type revenue but can an unemployed person file a claim Senator Mann Madam Chair Senator so just Briefly on your other question, we've had multiple physicians, caretakers uh, testify already, so they certainly have had a great voice on, on this bill, um, which has been very helpful. Um, so to your second question, if you, to, in order to apply for leave from employment, you have to be employed. Okay. I, 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 we got another answer coming. I, I saw the mic being slid over. Yeah. Oh, Ms. P Fitzpatrick, did you? Well, I just wanted to speak to, again, the jurisdiction of this <clears throat> committee. Um, as I mentioned, um, MFIP and uh, em many people on MFIP are in the employed workforce. They're, um, they have jobs, and that's part of our goal of MFIP for them to uh, be employed and, and receive some additional support from MFIP to get financially stable. Um, so those are the people we're talking about that would be eligible for paid family medical leave. You have to have earnings um, and your, your benefit is based on those past earnings. Senator Edke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And right, that's what I was after because we, we know what MFIP is and the clientele that it's there to help. But I just wanted to make sure that a person couldn't be collecting unemployment insurance and paid family medical leave at the same time. Uh, Chair Ms. Fitzpatrick, <laughs> Chair Wicklin, Senator Aki, yes, I mean, under unemployment insurance, you have to be available and eligible to uh, take a job. That's one of the underlying conditions of unemployment insurance. Presumably, these uh, folks that we're talking about that are in the MFIP program that are in the paid labor force as well uh, would not, again, be able to work because of one of those underlying leave conditions, uh, the, one of the conditions that uh, makes them eligible for uh, the program. Okay, and, and just to clarify, it's it's definitely a no. They cannot double dip on That's this. Definitely a no. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Senator Atke? when we do get to the point uh, of uh, voting on this, uh, um, our part of the bill, I would request a roll call and that it be recorded in a journal. Senator Atke, re request a roll call, and seeing three, well, I do not seeing three hands will be recorded in the journal. Uh, are there other questions? Senator Abler? Well, thanks, and uh, thanks, Senator Mann, for bringing this forward. I, I think who would not be in favor of such a program? Like, oh, family medical leave. It sounds great. i uh, got to catch up with the rest of the world. And I think what we're actually in, cheering for is a slogan. And um, Hippocratic Oath is above all do no harm. And I'm just, uh, I don't have a big speech. I'm just telling you, this, this thing really needs to be crafted narrowly. We have a working program currently and the state employees get six weeks. And I would rather that we would have built it off of that working program. We know what it costs, we know how it's managed and, and, and increase from there, add on, if you want 12 weeks and make it 12 weeks or, or whatever, but um, I'm just um, concerned. And I, I know how these things go and there's a hearing and nothing much changes and there's another hearing and nothing much changes, another hearing, nothing much changes. So. Um, Fortunately for this, we have a particularly gifted author uh, who knows how to listen, and I hope as this moves through the processes that, 
that that listening can be engaged in. And at the end, we can find a program that actually works that doesn't really make it hard for small businesses to stay open. Uh, with COVID and all that, there is so little reserve in some of these small businesses, including mine. If you want to have your small business do bad, be in office a long time, because <laughs> people don't care you're there anymore after a while. Uh, but there's a, I have a couple things. And Madam Chair, I think that uh, there is a section that you did not mention that's part of this committee. It's on page 11, the definition of health care provider. And uh, so I don't have an amendment prepared, but um, it says uh, 1124, health care provider means uh, uh, individuals who's licensed to uh, practice various uh, Practices that is our jurisdiction, Madam Chair, um, and then but then it, it it lists a variety of positions and APRNs and osteopaths and whatnot, and then it also says uh, eleven point two eight any other individual determined by the commissioner, uh, Senator Mann. Do you know who that might include eventually, and in, why do we even need that part, Senator Mann, Madam Chair, Senator Abler. Well, so. Because there's lots of different care providers that can participate, right? Chiropractors, podiatrists, um, who d have direct patient care and who can testify to a patient's need for leave. Um, we left that open because there are so many different providers who practice health care. We are actually currently having conversations to further define that definition. Um, and so thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, well, thanks, and I'm happy to, and I didn't bring an amendment, Senator I just, but I, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so I appreciate it. My, my suggestion is that you maybe list who you mean and not require rulemaking to happen. Rulemaking delays things that has costs, uh, uncertainty, and certainly chiros and PTs and podiatrists all do uh, primary interactions with people and are, are trusted and, you know, I may, have allowed, I may have allowed to sign death certificates. Not that I want to do that, but that's in our practice act. So I appreciate that. Um, and and uh, just a question about, not for this committee, I don't see Senator Hoffman here yet, but on page 10, it talks about, on line 1030, discusses family care. And I'm interested in the interactions, how this would interact with the waiver services that people have. And this may actually need to go to uh, his committee to see how this interacts with waiver clients, because it says family care means an applicant caring for a family member with a serious health condition or caring for a family member who's a covered service member. I don't even know what that part means. But, um, and then there's a whole list of family members, many of whom are being cared for informally and formally by individuals who are, experienced, who are in waiver programs and not in waiver programs. And so I think how you want to interact, that, I think that needs to be addressed. And so I'll just, you might just want to think about that. Um, and I was just, uh, I mean, this is an interesting bill, and I've, I like the idea. And so I don't know how I'm going to vote on the bill, and I don't know if it makes you listen to me more, I'll vote for it just for now to, to be a part of the process. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's ready to go just yet. And I, I hope that as you listen, Senator Mann, to the, to the advice of people with legitimate concerns, like the man who spoke there, I don't think he's against the whole thing. Uh, but you just... <laughs> So many businesses are on the edge, and we're having such a hard time finding employees as it is to create an incentive for someone to be gone in a two-person operation could actually literally put that place into not any work. And so, but to this committee's uh, jurisdiction, the MFIP piece, um, so I'm curious why on 6622, I can see you've rewritten that uh, just to kind of keep all those, that, those 12 months baby business, that's all below there. Um, but so people that have a, a plan, but then suddenly they're on this medical leave, they can quit planning. And I, so I don't know why you'd want to necessarily exclude them from that. I mean, maybe they wouldn't have to, they could change their activities a little bit because they're helping somebody who's sick. Um, but I don't know why they, because the way it reads, it says a one parent and a two parent family unit is not required to have an employment plan if that parent's receiving benefits. So I don't know why you'd want to suspend their plan, but I, th I think you maybe want to say something like they don't have to work on it quite as hard while they're getting leave because they're obviously helping somebody. Um, and that just got that. Pro have you thought about that, Senator Mann? Senator Mann. Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator, what line are you referring to? 
uh, line, it, it, it's the section that begins on 66.22 and continues through uh, 27. So you can look at that and work on it, but I, okay. I think it's a gap that you don't mean. I'll take a look. Thanks. Any and, other comments related to that? Okay. You can take that down and, and, yeah. and look at it. And, and Madam Chair, I'm almost um, Senator Abler. Um, and is it, uh, I don't know the amounts of money that people are getting. So people are getting MFIP, and now we're calling this earned income uh, on line 67.13. And so if they're on the border of MFIP eligibility, I, I'm just, I don't even know who, what person who's on MFIP is going to be getting family leave anyway, because people can work and get a little bit of money on MFIP. Uh, but is there a chance that someone's going to blink off of MFIP when this is covered? And I know that would not be the intention of your, your, your testifier, but have you considered the interactions with income standards and people blinking in and out and, and a disincentive to, to work and to whatever? Does that make sense? Senator Mann or, or Ms. Fitzpatrick? Chair Wicklin, Senator Abler, uh, yes, we've considered that. So I think it's important to note that the wage replacement under uh, Senate File 2 is partial wage replacement. So our lowest income workers would be receiving about 90% of their wages replaced. So it would be unlikely that you would see a situation where their income would actually go up um, that would make them ineligible for the program. Uh, Again, the idea is that, that the wage replacement is unlikely to be more than they're earning currently. Thanks. And just one last question. Senator Abler. And again, in the jurisdiction of this committee, they, we, we've tried really hard to make people be incented to work because there's a huge glass ceiling in the MFIP world. I mean, you, you can get a lot of benefits. You can get health care and child care and some housing, but at the end, it's, it tops out and it really does limit, and that's, you know, the person's chance to succeed and to have whatever amenities others, you know, enjoy that they just can't give an asset limits and all that. Um, do you think that this is going to create any, Senator Mann, do you think this is going to, Madam Chair, Senator Mann, do you think this is going to cause any disincentive for people to continue working? Um, or do you think it may help them draw into the workforce? Senator Mann? Madam Chair, Senator. So people who require MFIP generally are not, they don't, they don't sit at home at night and go, I'm so happy that I'm poor and I need government assistance, right? Um, this is not going to incentivize anyone to stay at home and do nothing because A, you have to qualify to have this leave. And then B, you're getting less than your actual paycheck. So you're getting even less. So you're already struggling. You're already requiring assistance. Now you're going to get less. So it's not going to incentivize anyone not to work. Thirdly, the program has shown to actually put people back in the workforce, right? So people with access to pay leave return to the workforce versus if you don't have access to the pay leave, you leave. You, you stop working for whatever reason, and you do not return. And so for all those reasons, um, the answer is no. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. That was meant to be a softball to let her uh, indicate the intent, and I appreciate your answer. So thank you all very right. much. That's thank all I you. got, Madam Chair. Thank you. S Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for bringing this important bill forward, Senator Mann. Um, you know, as an obstetrician, I have watched helplessly as patients have returned to work against medical advice days after giving birth. Um, and it, it confounds me why we would not want new mothers to have a short period of time with their newborn babies. Um, I just had to share that because it, it, I think that's so important. Sometimes I think we, we, we forget about the individual human beings that we're talking about and how this would impact their lives. Um, you mentioned some of the really compelling benefits to a paid family leave program like decreasing maternal morbidity and mortality, uh, like increased breastfeeding, like improved mental health. Um, and we're hearing a lot about concerns about workforce. And I'm wondering if we can look to um, other states and other countries that have paid family leave programs, if there's evidence to support that this in fact 
improves, as you just mentioned, improves workforce, both recruitment and retention. Is there evidence from other states or countries, um, either of you? Thank you. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Morrison. Um, so yes, there is uh, certainly evidence that paid family leave increases employee retention, um, increases productivity, uh, and you don't have to believe me or take my word for it. I have a literal box of studies here with all of the data uh, to support all those claims. And again, when we talk about paid family leave, you know, we talk about money, we talk about businesses. Um, small businesses have found this to be quite a benefit for them because they are now, they can compete with larger businesses in offering the same benefits. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's not, um, so we're looking for. It's not a surprise, right? When you have an employee who has to take time off, you don't have to all of a sudden scramble to find how to, to provide that leave if you so wish to do that. It's, it's there. So it's not a surprise to employers they can budget for that. Um, and then lastly, again, the, the um, medical benefits of this. We talk about leave. Again, we talk about money. We talk about business. We don't talk about the people that is going to impact. And we spend so little time actually talking about the people and the benefits of a, a program like this. We're talking about, you know, we don't let dogs be separated from their moms before eight weeks by law. And yet 25% of women in Minnesota hand over their two week old babies to somebody else to take care of. And so, you know, Again, this, this impacts so many lives, so many people, and we don't talk about those people. We don't talk about the health benefits of bonding with a child. We don't talk about maternal health. Um, and I find this particular piece of information to be astounding, that in 1987, the state of Minnesota enacted the Parental Leave Act of Minnesota. And that provided new parents six weeks of job-protected unpaid leave. And during the legislative hearings for this, for this program that would keep moms and their babies together, we talked about job protection, we talked about employee costs, and those were the main focus of discussion. The bonding between a mom and a new baby were briefly mentioned, and the maternal health aspect of this was not mentioned at all. We wrote a bill to affect women, and we did not talk about women, which I find Astounding, right? We didn't talk about sexual dysfunction. We didn't talk about pain with sexual intercourse, constant fatigue, sleep deprivation, urinary incontinence, breast pain, breast infections, all these things that are impacting women on a daily basis we don't talk about. And so I'm, I'm very happy you brought that up and you got me going. Um, because again, the importance of this bill cannot be overstated. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Morrison, any? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I couldn't have said it better myself, <laughs> Senator Mann. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member questions? Uh, Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I don't know, I, probably I was just going to weigh in a little bit, and I think uh, Senator Abler covered some of this too. And, you know, um, in today's times, I'm probably not against paid family medical leave options. I'm just totally against the mandated version. We've got, um, we had one of our testifiers talk about what can be done in the private sector. I know what we can do in the private sector because I've traveled around the United States and participated in some forums on this. And, uh, you know, I'm just coming from a, an angle that I think there's much better ways to do this, to be able to offer these benefits. These benefits do not fit every employer, and we need to leave that up to the employer to make that choice. And so um, as much as... I can't support this bill, you know, the, the, the idea of it is something we need to work for. It's just the way we're going about it is what I'm against at this point. So thank you. Thank you. And um, I'd kind of like to move towards vote. Are there, Senator Abler? You... Well, thanks. And I, I really appreciate the discussion. And uh, I support family leave in some version. Um, this is the one that's moving. I'm going to vote for it today uh, to show I'm interested in your box of studies. I'm interested in the welfare of women. Um, on my professional side, I've seen everything you've talked about um, as we've tried to help uh, the women have a safe delivery and 
caring for the infants afterwards. Um, and I, it's, so my, my encouragement to you, Senator Mann and the co-authors and the advocates, let's get this to be a good thing if we can minimize some of the potential pitfalls that are still in the bill. So I'm here to work on that. And so I just want to encourage you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, members. Um, seeing no other comments or, uh, Senator Mann, did you wish to make any other closing comments before we move to a vote? Okay, and um, Senator Mann, um, oh, and before we do that, I, I didn't make note of it before we began the meeting and I, I should have done so. Um, Senator Bolden is participating remotely today, so she is on the Zoom and has been on the Zoom since the beginning of our hearing. Um, which is um, an option that we have allowed for in our rules. So um, I just wanted to make sure people were aware that, that she is uh, present online and will be able to vote remotely. Um, Senator Mann, um, can you please make your motion to move the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that Senate File 2 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. Thank you. Um, since there has been a request for a roll call, um, Ms. Ryan, will you please take the roll? Chair Wicklin? Yes. Vice Chair Mann? Yes. Senator Utke? No. Senator Abler? Yes. Senator Bolden? Yes. Senator Kupek? Yes. Senator Liskey? No. Senator Morrison? Yes. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. There being six yes votes and two no votes, uh, the motion prevails um, and the, the bill, um, excuse me, the, the motion prevails, Senate file two as, um, yeah, Senate File 2 is recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. And now we will move to, I have um, two bills on the agenda and uh, Vice Chair Mann will take over as chair so I can present my bills. Okay, members, next we'll take up Senate File 53. Um, Madam Chair, I believe you have an author's amendment. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I do have an author's amendment, and I believe the author's amendment is the A3. Is that correct, Council? And um, this amendment brings the bill into the, the shape that um, I would like to have it discussed today. It, uh, it removes part of the bill that we had originally brought forward that um, had to do with basic sliding fee, child care, um, and then we determined that it was not gonna be uh, feasible to implement as that was written. Um, it changes the appropriation for the stabilization grants um, somewhat, um, and then it appropriates instead of the 20 million um, appropriated to early learning scholarships, it changes that to 40 million, which takes in the 
what we had proposed to allocate to the basic sliding fee and moves it to early learning scholarships. So that is the. Senator Abler. Oh, thanks, Madam Chair and Madam Chair. Thanks for describing the amendment. I appreciate it. Okay. You're welcome. Um, so that describes the amendment. Okay. Um, so all those in favor of the author's amendment, please say aye. 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 All those against? Um, and Madam Chair, I will proceed with my Yes, please, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so today we have um, two different bills that we're taking up that relate to child care. Um, these won't be the only two bills that we bring forward that relate to early childhood and care and education system in Minnesota. Uh, but these are, are two high priority um, items that I would like to see move forward early in session um, to begin to address our, our needs in the early childhood area. Um, there are many steps we need to take to address the challenges we face in terms of families being able to find high quality childcare that they can afford. Um, and it's located where and when they need it. Um, and ensuring that providers are compensated for the difficult and complex work they do. Um, our society and economy will benefit from these solutions that we bring forward this session. Um, and I also wanted to mention as an aside that in order to help our committee and um, all of us learn more about the current landscape in Minnesota, we are going to have a joint hearing with the Education Finance Committee on February 2nd, a uh, week from Thursday. And we will have an opportunity to learn about um, early childhood development, the key needs, in our current programs and the roles that our committees will play in coming forward with solutions this session. So the Senate file um, 53 uh, relates to the stabilization base grants modification and also to uh, increasing funding for early learning scholarships. Um, this funding uh, would help uh, both families and providers uh, continue to um, exist and, and be available for families in the short term. This is fiscal year 23 funding that would be um, go out as soon as possible and would be helpful. Um, the stabilization grants have helped both family child care and center-based child care supplement their compensation and assist in keeping programs open. Uh, but the grants are scheduled to be reduced significantly in March and they will end um, at the end of June. Um, so this bill would allow providers to receive an amount that's closer to their current monthly amount through June um, rather than seeing it decrease. It does not provide funding to go um, past the June 30th date. Um, this funding is essential given the continuation of other stresses that are facing childcare providers. There's low compensation um, of staff, in a current job market where higher wages are more easily found by employees, um, there's a challenge um, that results in retaining workers. And um, there's not an ability for providers to charge families more because they simply cannot f afford to pay more. Uh, during the period between September 2021 through June of 2022, on average, over 29,000 child care workers received this additional compensation each month. And so it is uh, an item that is going out to a significant number of providers in the state, and we wish to see it continue at the rate that, um, it, closer to the rate that it is currently at um, through the end of June. Uh, additional funding for early learning scholarships would allow more families to access child care providers of their choice, and this is a one-time appropriation to extend um, the number of scholarships available. Uh, both of these, as I mentioned, expenditures would utilize funding from this fiscal year to help families and providers immediately. And now I'd like to move to the testifiers. Thank you, Madam Chair. First on our list, we have Karen and Thea DeVos um, on Zoom. Please identify yourselves for the record and proceed with your testimony. Oh, 
Okay. They do, uh, do not appear to be there, so we'll move to uh, Dr. Deborah Messenger, uh, also on Zoom. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Chair Wicklund and members of the committee, my name is Deborah Messenger, and I've been in child care as a child care teacher and a building owner of All Ages and Faces Academy in St. Paul for over 23 years. I'm also a leader with Kids Count on Us, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to SF53. When I first told staff that they would be receiving bonuses from the first child care stabilization grant, one cried. There were emotional tears over how impactful a few hundred dollars was for them. Our society has undervalued and underpaid our child care professionals for far too long. They are highly skilled and dedicated, and yet we do not have the funds to pay them more than a dog walker or a pet sitter. The child care stabilization grants have shown us what a child care system that is valued and funded as a public good can look like. We can fairly compensate teachers. Families can get the accessible and affordable care they need. Kids can get the high quality care that we know is so critical between the ages of zero and five. These three core values can only be honored if we fund our child care system. Without these grants, we will not be able to hire and retain teachers and staff. And without them, we will have a child, no child care system at all. I am pleased to see that SF53 returns the grants to the 2021 levels through June. I urge you to vote in favor of this emergency bill to allow us to stay open as we work together over the legislative session to build a sustainable child care system that values family, children, providers, and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Messenger. Next up, we have Claire Sanford. You can come up to the table. Please sign in and introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Claire Sanford, and I am the Government Relations Chair of the board on the board of the Minnesota Child Care Association, which is a statewide nonprofit association of licensed child care centers, diverse program types. And before I continue, I just want to clarify something. Karen and Thea DeVos, the, the testifiers who weren't on Zoom, I'm sorry for any confusion, they're actually testifying on the next bill. So Madam Chair, if you could call them again, that would be great. I got a text from Karen and she said, I was trying to get on, but I had a baby in my arms because she's in her infant room. So they're there, they're ready for the next bill. We, the Minnesota Child Care Association, stand for quality for young children, choice and affordability for families, and increased compensation for the professionals who serve them. SF53 is an immediate emergency patch aimed at all three of these groups. It provides an infusion of early learning scholarships, which I realize is not in this committee's jurisdiction, to give families who need it choice and access to quality child care now so children can learn while their parents can earn and get into the workforce. And as already mentioned, it keeps current stabilization grant payments to child care from decreasing between now and June. Grants that by law are minimally 70% directed towards increased compensation for our workforce, although most providers are using more than that. The reality is that while we do have a dearth of child care spots statewide, we currently can't even fill the spots we have due to a lack of our own workforce, the workforce behind the workforce. If we want to, at the very least, maintain our inadequate supply of child care, this is not the time to reduce resources to retain early educators. And this is something tangible um, to give now as help to families and child care providers while we work on structural issues during the rest of session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanford. Next up, we have Andre Dukes. If you can come up to the table. Introduce yourself for the record, sign in, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the, com the committee. 
My name is Andre Dukes. I am the Vice President of Family and Community Impact at the Northside Achievement Zone, and I'm also a board member with Think Small, so I'll be speaking from both of those lenses today. Um, I'm here in desperate support of this $40 million one-time investment, which would address an emergency faced by children and families and immediately provide them with scholarships to access quality childcare and early learning. I acknowledge that this is not a long-term solution, but it is a meaningful step that must be taken right now to address this emergency our most vulnerable families and children find themselves in. There are nearly 900 children on Think Small scholarship wait list, and while there is a reality of an educator shortage, we also know that there are areas where children can enroll today if awarded an early childhood scholarship. We also know that 85% of families that get a scholarship via Think Small are in a priority group, which means that they're homeless, in foster care, or child protection. And that over 80% of them are identified by their parent or caregiver as children of color. Research has consistently shown that access to early childhood education is critical to later development and overall success of children. Many policies and extensive research focus on the importance of addressing barriers and improving access for all children. However, concerns remain around ongoing issues with equitable access, overall impact, and sustainability. According to the Office of Research, Planning, and Evaluation, access to early care and education means that parents with reasonable effort and affordability can enroll their child in an arrangement that supports the child's development and meets the parent's need. This definition may serve as an indicator of success or of a successful child care system and if it were to be used as a current measure of success in our state, it would be clear that we are failing quite miserably. With child care shortages, high cost of families, and declining access and support for centers who struggle to meet quality standards, the Northside Achievement Zone works to build a cradle to career college or cr cradle to college pipeline that we believe will end multi-generational poverty. Our experience has been that children who attend one of our early childhood anchor partners are more proficient in reading by third grade than their peers. That's why we raise about $1 million a year in private funds for scholarships. And even this, even with this, we have still had to work strategically with our partners at Think Small to braid and blend public and private resources so that more families have access to and remain in quality programs until they reach kindergarten. With, the, with close to 5,000 children, zero to five on the north side, there are only enough available slots for about half of these children, and we are only able to support a fraction of the need within our population. This issue also has a direct impact on the economic mobility of families of color when we look at parents' ability to remain in the workforce, continue their education, and build wealth. Over the long term, we need substan sub substantial ongoing investments, and we will be back to ask for that. But this short-term emergency funding is critical to the future of our children. Every day, a child uh, is stuck on a wait list they are foregoing opportunities to develop their, and with their parents and caregivers to support their families. So thank you for your time and action in making this critical investment. Thank you, Mr. Dukes. Uh, members, questions, discussions? Seeing none. Uh, Madam Chair, do you have a motion? Oh, oh Madam, uh, Senator Abler. I think meant for the testifier. Um, anyway, I, I appreciate, we, we discussed this a lot over the, thank you, sir. Um, we appreciate, we've discussed this all a lot, and I actually am a big fan of scholarships. And uh, we tried to get more of those, and it just didn't work out before with the, uh, anyway, th we were disallowed to spend some of the money how we wanted. So it's nice to have extra money just to do that. 
because uh, there's a great benefit in helping you know, all families have access to the quality that, that people would like. Um, and so I understand this is a kind of a stopgap bill, and then you're hoping uh, as time goes on to fill in some of the gaps. Um, so I, and I respect that, and I, I'm not against it. I just, um, I, I'm just, if it turns out to be one-time funding, in particular for the grants, we've achieved even a greater cliff. Um, and so I hope that the individuals, as they're going to get the uh, increased um, stabilization grants, realize that there's no assurance that those are going to go forward. There's still a whole debate going on in which I'm only a, smaller discussion part of than I was, but it's a matter of what priorities your caucus has and the governor and, and so on to have those continue. So uh, part of why we ramped them down was so they could, people become independent and, of those and, and realize that they were going to phase out. So just to, to caution everybody. Um, and there's, there's one thing, and just as you write the bill, is it, is it moving today? Madam Chair and Senator Whitman. Chair, Chairman, Senator Abler, yes, this bill is being referred to the Education Finance Committee okay. because the early learning scholarships oh, yeah. aspect is within the jurisdiction of yeah. that committee. Well, thanks, and Madam Chair. Uh, it seems like you're trying to move it quick, which is totally understandable. Um, just advice as you go forward in Section 3, um, you might want to find a way to carry that money forward if it's not all spent. I know there's been some uptake issues with some of the licensed homes. I think the licensed centers have more capacity to apply for these and they can endure some of the um, requirements and all the paperwork. I know a lot of licensed homes just have given up. Uh, the amounts were smaller and it was intended to help all and we just have such attrition there. So just to encourage that and maybe as you just in your meetings see what can be made to soften the impact on licensed homes to make it easier for them to take this money because we absolutely we've lost so many slots there. So. Um, so for today, Madam Chair, I, I, I guess I'll be voting to move this along. Um, and uh, thanks. Thank you, Senator. Madam Chair, any comments? Um, thank you, Chairman. I just in response, um, yes, I believe the, the providers have known that the this initial um, period of time where we have the stabilization grant funding, that that will come to an end um, at the end of June. Um, I think that it does does point out that we need to do um, a lot more work to make sure that after, if those are no longer provided, you know, how are we going to be stabilizing um, and sustaining um, this workforce? Uh, family child care, care providers, I have been um, utilizing the program um, at a very high percentage um, of their providers are taking or are receiving the, the provider grants, um, but we can always do more to you know out, have outreach to them, and and if we do go forward with a different program, um, you know always I know that DHS works a lot on listening to uh, providers in terms of how easy or hard it is to apply, and so that's I think a consideration that they'll make um, in any program that moves forward. Um, but I, I think that the, the reason that we want to do this now is that providers are still um, struggling. Um, parents are still struggling to find um, adequate child care for their children. And I think the testimony today points to that. And that's why we want to move it forward with, with urgency, um, knowing that we need to do more work to understand whether... Um, putting together a program or package of other bills that, you know, will continue some form of uh, grants, um, continue um, discussion about early learning scholarships and other, other methods to support the workforce. So, I, thank you. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Senator Wicklin, for uh, bringing this bill forward. And just a note, um, apologies for not having my camera on. I'm having some connectivity issues. But um, just wanted to um, share my thanks and, and just share, you know, in my community, I hear often um, what a lifeline the stabilization grants have been to child care providers. And, and really, it is what is keeping them afloat um, over these last uh, months. And so, um, as has been said, this really is the workforce behind the workforce as we're seeing workforce uh, shortages and issues in many sectors. 
um, a lot of that, um, you know, it certainly is a, a contributing factor that if there are, you know, folks don't have um, safe places and affordable places to take their kids uh, for care, they are coming out of the workforce. And so um, this is an incredibly important issue. And this, this um, aspect has been very, very helpful for, um, uh, you know, centers and providers, uh, childcare providers in my community and I know across the state. And so I um, just appreciate you bringing this forward and, and looking forward to continuing the work because as has been shared, um, you know, we need to continue this work into the future as well. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Other questions, concerns, comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, Senator, uh, Madam Chair, would you like to make a motion? Thank you, thank you, Chairman. I would like to move that Senate File 53, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Education Finance. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The motion prevails. Uh, Senate File 53, as amended, is recommended to pass and is referred to the Committee on Education Finance. Next up, we have Senate File 14. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe you have an author's amendment. Um, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have an author's amendment. I have the A3 amendment as uh, my author's amendment, and that is the one that um, was most recently posted. Uh, it combines um, some items that came together this morning with what we had planned for the amendment. So it just uh, incorporates uh, more information into this author's amendment. Um, I'll talk about it since we had um, more than one of these author's amendments posted. Um, so one thing it does in um, section, thank you, uh, section two, subdivision four, um, we wanted to make clear that if we change the rates, um, reimbursement rates for the CCAP program, um, that um, providers can still charge um, private full paying client rates that are, are less than or provide discounts and scholarships to the rates that they provide. So it just, it just states that they're still allowed to do that. Um, the section three, four, and five reflect the figures from the fiscal note that you should have in your packets as well that was provided um, for the bill. And so I didn't, we didn't have that until this morning and so that is incorporated. I don't know if members have any other questions about the amendment. Any questions about the amendment? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I had one other. Go ahead. Um, Chairman, uh, I missed the, the first line. Um, it makes an adjustment in the implementation date. Um, instead of implementing the rate increase in November, it would change it to August. And that's part of bringing the bill forward early in session that we can make that adjustment um, so that they have time to work on the implementation of the new rates. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Wickland. Um, I totally understand this project, and I, I appreciate your efforts and all that, and I'm not even against it. I, we were just worried before about uh, sustainability in the Child Care Development Fund and how the money was, the block grant, or if that's the right name for it, um, and how that would be uh, you know, not sustainable, and clearly you're putting general fund into this. Um, and so in the amendments, you're, um, you're intending to make this a permanent appropriation. Is that what that all is? So there's, there's not a two-year thing. It's a four-year, it's a, it's a base change. Uh, is that correct? I, I would ask um, Mr. Albrecht if he would comment on the way that that language is written. I, I believe it's an ongoing, it would be an ongoing um, Madam Chair, Senator Wickland and Senator Abler, um, yes, the appropriations for both the Child Care Assistance Program and the Basic Sliding Fee Program are ongoing. Uh, thank you. Senator Abler. Um, Senator Uckey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just for clarification, because as I was reading this, I missed it. With the A3, are those numbers, did you say they are included in the fiscal note we've got? Madam Chair. Um, Chairman, yes, um, Senator Rutke, yes, they're included in the, the SF 14-1A fiscal note that's in the packets today. Okay. Senator Rutke. Thank you. 
Any other questions about the amendments? All right, so on the motion to adopt the author's amendment, uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The um, amendment is adopted, uh, Madam Chair, to your bill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this bill uh, does a couple things. It increases the rates paid to child care providers under the Child Care Assistance Program, and it um, will increase that to the 75th percentile of the most current market rate survey. This reflects a change um, also in, in using the most current survey rather than a um, designated year survey. It would keep us current going forward. Um, this change to the 75th percentile um, would align us with the federal recommendations and would allow families to access three out of four providers um, in the market today based on um, market rates uh, rather than today's 30th percentile rates uh, for uh, children um, other than infants and toddlers where we're using the 40th percentile rates. Um, increasing the rates is especially important in greater Minnesota communities where providers need to have a mix of families, um, some who may um, be eligible for child care assistance and some others who aren't. Uh, when CCAP rates are low, as they are today, um, it makes it more challenging for the providers to get by and have um, sufficient access to, to families being able to um, provide enough funding for them to, to subsist. Um, when CCAP rates are low, uh, excuse me, by raising reimbursement rates, we are helping all types of providers across Minnesota, family child care providers and center-based providers will be able to provide um, care in their communities and have a more sustainable business. Uh, by increasing the rates, we are increasing choice for families by making it possible for more providers to accept children who are coming with child care assistance payments. Currently, Minnesota is one of the um, bottom 10 states in our reimbursement rates. Um, this change to increase the rates is desperately needed. And you may wonder why it's important to bring this forward early in session, um, because work to implement new rates takes time, and setting them early will allow providers to start receiving these new reimbursement rates sooner this year, which helps um, when we know that um, parents are having a hard, difficult time finding providers, and providers are having a difficult time staying open. Um, and now um, I would like to move to my testifiers. Thank you, Chair Wicklund. Uh, first up, we have Karen and Thea DeVos uh, on Zoom. Please introduce yourselves for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Karen DeVos. I am the owner of Little Learners Early Childhood Center in Ada and Halstead, Minnesota. We are small rural communities in the northwest part of our state. I have 25 years experience in the early childhood field, previously serving 16 years as a family child care provider and the last nine as a center owner, director, and preschool teacher, and today as an infant teacher. I'm here today with my daughter Thea, and she is a recent Hamlin graduate who has grown up immersed in the child care world, and she's back working in our sites as a teacher and assistant director before she heads off to law school in the fall. I have her with me today because my children have become the face of our business. Without my teen and adult children pulling together to work at Little Learners while going to high school and college, we wouldn't have enough staffing to keep, to keep our classroom doors open. I'm here today as a small business owner, um, as a child care provider, and as a mom to voice my support for Senate File 14 raising child care assistance base rates to the 75th percentile of current market rates and updating them to new market rates every three years. While I don't believe that this one change will fix every problem with accessibility and low wages in the early childhood field, I do believe it is one step that we desperately need to take. I want to just give you a few facts here about CCAP. So the Child Care Assistance Program, otherwise known as CCAP, is depended on by families in all 87 counties across Minnesota. Greater Minnesota providers rely especially on CCAP as population density dictates that to be viable. 
A provider must be able to serve a mix of families across the income spectrum, from low to medium and high, because there isn't enough of one demographic to form a solid client business base for business stability. Base rates at the 75th percentile of current market rates for a community is the minimum recommendation from the, from the Department of Health and Human Services. Rates at the 75th percentile would mean that a family using CCAP would have their tuition covered at three out of four providers in their area, giving them actual choice for where to enroll their children. Automatically updating the rates during every three-year market rate survey cycle would give providers the confidence to invest in their programs, whether that means compensation, expansion, or, qual or quality, knowing that rates wouldn't stay stagnant while costs rose. And it's important to note that only eight states have CCAP rates lower than Minnesota. Minnesota can definitely do better. As I look at the last 25 years, my career, how this field has evolved, and how I have evolved as a provider, I'm so proud. We look at our children differently now. We see these first five years as a vital time in a child's life. Unfortunately, we are still not compensating those who do that important work. The longer we continue to ignore things like childcare assistance, the deeper the hole we, we will dig. If I can't afford to pay appropriate wages to my staff, they will go somewhere else. Almost half of the children at Little Learners are considered under middle income. Raising childcare assistance rates would mean higher wages for my team and a break for my own kids and would show everyone that Minnesota really is ready to make an investment in our children. That is why I, Karen DeVos, and my daughter, Thea, on behalf of Little Learners, support Senate File 14. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen and Thea DeVos, and congratulations on your law school start. I think you're going to be just fine there. Um, next up, we have Monique Stummen. You can come up to the table, sign in, introduce yourself for the record, and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Um, thank you all for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, I am a leader with Kids Count on Us. I am a owner director of School Readiness Learning Academy in North Minneapolis. Um, I'm coming this morning to speak on support of the SF14. Ms. Stumman, I'm sorry, could you just introduce yourself for the record? Say your name. Monique Webb Stumman. I am the owner director of School Readiness Learning Academy in North Minneapolis. I want to just thank you all for allowing me to speak this morning. Um, this increase will allow me to increase wages for my staff. Um, it's hard right now to even get people to work. Um, I'm pretty sure it's hard everywhere, but it's we're doing some critical work. Um, and we need this um, SF-14. We need your support. Um, we are nationally accredited. We are four-star rated. It costs us money to keep those credentials. And so my husband um, works 12-hour days on the railroad, and when he's off, he is there helping us with these children. My daughter just recently opened a home daycare, and it's hard for her as well to find help um, so that she can sustain herself. Um, Wayman AME Church, if they were not helping me fill the gap, if my husband and I were not paying out of pocket to fill the gap, we wouldn't be open today. We stayed open during COVID so that your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews could have care. And so we're asking you all today to do the right thing. It's time. 30 percentile, 40 percentile, it's time. The national rate is 75th percentile. I'm asking that Minnesota do the right thing. It's time. We need to. Our families deserve it. Our children deserve it. My staff, the teachers that are helping get these children ready for school, we deserve it. And so I'm here asking you today to, to, to support the SF14, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Duman. 
Next up, Ms. Sanford. Introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm still Claire Sanford and I'm still with the Minnesota Child Care Association and I am extremely pleased to testify in support of Senate File 14, which is tied to access, affordability, and compensation, kind of like the previous bill, only this on an ongoing and stable basis. It seeks to restore child care assistance rates to the federally recommended 75th percentile of current market rates. Minnesota did reimburse at that level until budget cuts in 2003. So 2003 was the last flight of the Concord and the last year that Minnesota paid federally recommended child care assistance rates. We've spent the last 20 years trying to claw our way back. Demand for quality child care is there, but family choice and resources to access it are not, so supply suffers. I can give you a soliloquy on why child care is so expensive, but the fact remains that it is. Parents can't pay more and educators can't make less. For decades, we've been subsidizing the cost of child care on the backs of mostly women who provide it through low compensation, and low um, child care assistance rates are a huge part of that. Minnesota has painfully low reimbursement rates, only eight states have lower infant rates, for example, and infant toddler care is where the squeeze is most acute. And just, I mean, you've heard 11 states have rates lower. I just said eight states have infant rates lower. Just so you know the discrepancy, it's because child care assistant rates are paid by age level. So we might be, we're, you know, there are eight lower than us for infant rates, but for preschool rates, we, there might be 11 lower. I just didn't want people to go, oh, there's lots of different numbers. You know, this is terrible. That's the reason the numbers are slightly different. But across the board, Minnesota's real darn low <laughs> out of the nation um, across all of our age groups. Up until just a couple years ago, Minnesota was actually on a corrective action plan with the federal government because our rates were shockingly far from recommended levels and were nowhere close to giving equal access to low-income families. And we managed to move just high enough to get out of trouble with the feds a couple years ago, but we were warned not to be complacent because that level would not, that low level we're at now would not continue to be accepted in the future. When rates are this low, many providers choose not to accept child care assistance at all or set strict limits on the number of families who can enroll using it. Rates at the 75th percentile of current market would mean low-income working families could access three out of four providers in their area. It would encourage more providers to accept child care assistance and expand their capacity, adding supply. It would offer providers additional resources to increase compensation and better attract and retain quality early educators. And when you get right down to it, this bill is entirely necessary. It's not at all revolutionary. It's just getting us back to where we were two decades ago and it's more than time to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanford. Uh, members, comments, questions? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I, I, sorry, I was over in, in education presenting a bill. It was tough, man, they, they just ran me through the ringer, um, Senator Wickland, but at least it passed, that's all that matters, right? But it had to do with uh, student support personnel, but as we're talking about child care, and, and Monique, thank you. It was, it's, I, it was what a delight it was to sit here and see you, and it was to, so for members, I would go, um, go to her, go to her and, and make sure your board chair is there. You can ask music questions about um, a certain Senate president and, and such. It's, it's, it was a delight in the work that you're doing, and so I'm glad you were here. A um, couple of things. There's, there's still, as we're looking at increasing our public um, money into organizations. You know, I still have some concerns regarding some, you know, Title II of the ADA. You know, it's not all places are accessible. Or how are we going to um, help get you know, centers and homes accessible for all? If you're going to be open to the public, then you should have some accessibility standards in place. And is there any room or is there any bucket that we could, um, you know, have money set aside so you make that building or make those homes more accessible or is there a compliance issue and maybe that's another conversation Senator Wicklin because um, I, I I'm loving where you're going with this right you got the you got the, the school scholarship you got the scholarships going and you got the CCAP which is it's great to hear that we're just 
we're actually just correcting what we didn't get right a few years ago. So mm -hmm. now we can move forward. But as we go forward, I, I really want you to try to think about that and how that could be oppressed. Does that make sense to you? Chair Wicklin? Um, Chair, man, Senator Hoffman. Yes, I, I mean, I, I think in terms of this particular bill, it's it's more about um, the, the workforce itself. But I know that we do have um, proposals coming forward to um, put additional funding towards um, there are programs that actually help businesses with sort of the brick and mortar changes or physical changes or um, building up supply in that way. Um, I'm not sure if they have criteria that, you know, talk about accessibility as being a, a key goal or, you know, something that we would want to work towards in a, a separate manner, you know, including some funding that would specifically address that. I don't, I don't know, but I'd be happy to work with you on that because I do think this is a uh, kind of a combination approach that we need to take to um, increasing access. Um, increasing access means that it's affordable and that the providers are willing to work for wages um, in these settings. But it also means that the physically, you know, the, they have to have um, good accessible buildings and, and homes or facilities to, to care for children in a safe, you know, high quality manner. So I think it's definitely should be part of the discussion. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just uh, briefly wanted to, again, thank Senator Wickman for bringing this bill forward. Um, really important. And just to touch specifically on the um, raising the CCAP rates, um, I again want to tie it back to, as was mentioned before, like who this affects. And this will make a, a substantial difference for families in every corner of our state. It will allow families to have more choice in who is caring for their kids in the most um, you know, critical time. We know those years zero to three, zero to five, their little brains are developing. And so, um, you know, that time is so important and having them have access to this care is, is so important. And so giving them more choice and more options in that is, is also really important. And so um, I am grateful for you for bringing this bill in and uh, bringing us in line with where we were previously and will bring us up in line with, um, you know, many other states who are doing far better than us in this regard already. And so, thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, uh, Chair Wickland, do you have a motion? Or last uh, comments? Sure. I'll, I'll just make a uh, last comment that I, I uh, wanted to point out in the Early Childhood Workforce Index of 2020, Minnesota's uh, median wage for childcare workers was twelve dollars and six cents. Preschool teachers, it was seventeen dollars and forty six cents. Um, center directors, uh, twenty eight dollars and forty cents. Uh, I think we're we're really talking about ways to bring these wages up to a, a level that that people can um, even begin to to live on these wages. And increasing the reimbursement rates will be will help us take a step towards doing that. Um, I, I ask for your support. Um, as, we've, as I've stated already, we have an opportunity this year to, to really help children get off to a great start, also help families and our economy by um, investing in our early childhood system. And with that, um, I would make the motion that um, Senate File 14, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, with that, the motion prevails. Senate uh, file 14, as amended, is recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Finance. Uh, members will be back here tomorrow at 8.30 to hear the governor's budget. And with uh, no further business today, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.